Okay, so I have talked enough this morning, so I'm going to um, let our first presenters get started. Started. So to talk about cover crops and soil health, we have Andrea Bache and Mark Thompson. Andrea is an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture, where her research focuses on resilient cropping systems. And Mark Thompson is a far professional farm manager and farms himself in Humboldt and Webster counties where he uses cover crops. Andrea, I'll let you take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Lydia, and good morning to so many of you and so many familiar faces. It's um, such a pleasure to get to speak with all of you uh, this morning to kick off your cover crop boot camp and to talk about what is one of my favorite topics, which is cover crop, soil health, and water. And so this morning, what I'm going to talk to you about um, are why it might be important if our soils were a little bit more sponge-like and how we might get them that way. And um, Lydia did not mention this, but I am a proud Iowa State alum and a proud PFI member. So I've been to a number of meetings and I'm so pleased to see so many familiar faces uh, here today. So just to get us started, as we're thinking about what we're facing when it comes to water, we've had a lot of unusual and extreme events, right? So I feel like I need to mention the 2019 flooding that happened last year. It feels like a lifetime ago, but it was only about a year and a half. Um, that we experienced in Nebraska, very damaging and unusual flood event, right? So we had um, this confluence of very full bodies of water from a wet fall the year prior, a lot of snow and just water that was on the landscape that had nowhere to go when we got this bomb cyclone, really like a hurricane snowstorm event. And this is a photo from my partner's family farm. They have a um, multi-generation farm in central Nebraska. It's right on the Middle Loop River. And they lost what you see here is about um, a dozen or so farmable acres, other land that was um, had so much sand deposition, it may never be farmable again. And they're one of many um, families and communities that were severely impacted by um, this flood event. So that was 2019. And here we are in 2020, right? We're in Nebraska, at least. And see, there's a lot of Nebraska people who are on this call as well, um, that we have <clears throat> drought conditions, some more severe than others, some just uh, abnormally dry, but some to exceptional drought. So it's actually 100% of Nebraska as of the drought monitor last week, uh, that was in some stage of abnormally dry to drought. And on Iowa, it's uh, about 70% when I last checked too. So we are, you know, dealing with heavy rain juxtaposed by extreme drought, right? So I want to talk to you today about some of the work that I've done that demonstrates that actually adding a plant like a cover crop can help us manage water, um, which might seem counterintuitive, but I hopefully can, can drive that home. And I would love to hear in the breakout rooms discussion about this because there's a lot of experienced cover croppers and um, you know, how you think about the, the water management through cover crops, I think they can be a great tool. And just taking a couple steps back, thinking about the water cycle, right? Which is really just the continuous movement of water molecules through the atmosphere and the earth's surface, right? This is um, really fundamental when we think about what uh, our soil and, and water and plants can do, right? So what are the important components of the water cycle for agriculture, right? It's the the rain that we get from the atmosphere and precipitation or the water that we get. Um, it's how we do things like manage our groundwater or surface water if we have irrigation. Um, it is the water that plants are using or losses of water from the soil surface. So it's evapotranspiration. Um, other important components, the ones I'm gonna really focus on today are water moving into the soil. So that's infiltration. We can think about water losses of uh, water moving over the soil surface like runoff, and then the water that stays in the soil, right? So soil moisture infiltration are really the things that um, are kind of my favorite. If you had to pick a favorite part of the water cycle um, that I'm gonna talk about here this, this morning. And so when we think about the soil, what we're really doing in agriculture is, is trying to manage this water balance, right? We're trying to manage the inputs that we can get either uh, from irrigation or from the atmosphere. We're trying to balance that with what plant water needs are in, in water usage and transpiration and trying to minimize the losses that we might have through things like soil evaporation and runoff. And so when I think about all of these components and the soil surface, the soil profile, really this is the central component that's regulating all of those in and out flows of the water cycle, right? So that's why I like to say that the soil surface is really uh, where the action is, is happening. And so then just to, to take one more quick step back, when we think about our soils, they're really 
um, a matrix, not like a Keanu Reeves matrix, but a matrix of, of um, various properties. I like to think about this as soils like a pile of bricks, right? So different types of soils will have different sizes of bricks or different orientation of bricks, but a healthy soil is going to have uh, a portion that is empty space where gases and water can freely exchange. And within that matrix, we're also going to have uh, things like organic matter that are really a small portion of the soil, but really critical to um, the pool of living or once living um, materials that are cycling through that contribute to um, building up that organic pool, improving aggregation, um, that builds those bricks that help improve the structure such that the empty space of the soil is where gases and water can, can filter through, right? And so um, that all said, just taking a, a step back into the um, soil water cover crop nexus here, I think it is useful to think about how soils can behave like a sponge. And again, that has to do with the structure of the soil, the orientation of those bricks, the organic matter, and that we want our soils in these heavy rain events and drought conditions to be able to absorb water when it's abundant and then squeeze it back out when it's not abundant, right? And so this is really fundamental to me when we think about what soil health is. I'm sure that this is not a new concept to any of you. I feel like I should just share the, the definition here that it's the ability of the soil to continue to function and sustain life. And you know, how do we think about our soils for the future? How do we maintain the function of the biological, chemical, and physical aspects of the soil. This ties really nicely for me into how we think about soil for water management, right? And so, um, you know, just mentioning some of these principles that we know have been demonstrated to improve those functions of the soil. It's things like minimizing soil disturbance, maximizing the uh, crop or plant diversity that we have, integrating livestock, and maintaining continuous cover of the soil, right? So we can see here when we think about cover crops, they're doing at least um, two of these things. Um, they can certainly facilitate minimizing disturbance as well as integrating livestock, as well as the obvious of optimizing diversity above ground and maintaining cover and roots of the soil. And so I would guess that many of you on this call, there's so many people, which is really exciting, have seen some of these infographics before. I think that they're really, popular to convey the idea that a healthy soil can uh, hold more water if it has more organic matter, right? And this sounds really nice uh, just in an infographic, but there were a lot of kind of unanswered research questions that I have done some work on that I'm going to share here uh, briefly today um, that support some of these ideas. But there's, you know, again, open questions here. And so um, again, all well and good in concept, but do we really understand the contribution uh, that soil can make to reducing the impacts of rainfall variability and also how do we know which elements of those soil health management principles can have the greatest impact on infiltration. So I'm going to talk about infiltration here um, because it is so fundamental, right? The rate that water gets into the soil has a direct applicability to the heavy rain events that we get. And I'm going to tell you that no one loves a good infiltration rate anecdote from a farmer than I do. And I've heard many of them from people in this group um, and hopefully you'll be able to share some of them as well, because um, I think that they are really important and evocative for this idea. And so to try to answer this question, what we did um, in a few projects that I worked on, I have the citations here, it's all open access and I'm happy to share them with anyone, but they should be fairly easy to track down is that we searched for published experiments across the world where they had done two things, where they had measured infiltration rates. It's commonly done on field experiments. It's easy to do on your farm. Um, where they measured infiltration and they had a setup where they compared one of these aspects of a soil health management practice to a more conventional control. So you can see we found a lot of studies. This map shows uh, all the red dots across the world where we, we looked at different practices and compared them to more conventional controls. So I'm just going to show you these practices again and emphasize that what we were looking at was, you know, if you think about like an annual crop system, maybe with some soil disturbance, and then if you added livestock, what that impact on infiltration might be, if you minimized soil disturbance, if you added more than one crop, uh, if you had a cover crop compared to, again, a more conventional no cover crop system, or if you had a perennial system compared to an annual crop. So we looked at all of these studies and um, tried to see what the difference was in infiltration compared to a no cover crop control. 
And so I have very few graphs in my presentation, but I'll show you one here just at a high level. Um, what you're looking at is all those practices that I just showed you and the percent increase in infiltration. So the dots here are the averages, the lines are the range that we found. And so if these dots and lines are closer to zero, that means that that practice had a uh, limited to no effect on infiltration. But if they were above zero, that means that these practices were consistently leading to a uh, higher infiltration rate. So I've given you the, the punchline here right in my headline that what we found when we looked across these different practices is, the, is that the most consistent and largest impacts and uh, improvements in infiltration came from these practices that had continuous roots in the soil, which is which is pretty cool. And it makes sense if we you know think back to five minutes ago in my presentation when we're thinking about soil and structure and organic matter, um, that these continuous roots in the soil could be improving um, infiltration by a number of mechanisms, right? That those roots are improving porosity, improving soil structure, creating a habitat for more uh, microbial activity that's improving aggregation. Um, and, um, you know, improvements to organic matter, reduced soil compaction, um, et cetera. So the idea that more plants, more roots, more water, this all matters. Um, because we're not just thinking about how cover crops are using water, we should be thinking about how they're changing other aspects of our soil and the water cycle to improve water storage. I'm seeing a note that someone wants remote control of my screen. I don't know if that means something's wrong or it's just a glitch. I'm gonna just keep going. Someone stop me if needed. <laughs> okay, so those are from research experiments. I just wanna show you one other kind of fun thing that we've been doing with some of my research um, now with the University of Nebraska. Um, that's going on on actual farms, right? So we are participating with a project with the NRCS uh, in Nebraska, where we are collaborating with farmers who are doing on-farm research. I know you have an outstanding on-farm research network with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Similar idea that we have farmers across the state who set up uh, trials, strip trials of different cover crop man or not cover crop soil health management systems, and so they got to pick what those looked like and. Some people picked a strip of a cover crop compared to no cover crop. Some people are looking at uh, monoculture cover crops compared to cover crop um, mixes. Some people are looking at cover crops with and without livestock grazing. So these demonstration farms, on-farm research, different soil health management systems. And so I set that up just to show you some infiltration measurements that um, one of uh, the members of my team took last year on several of these farms. So what they did was they went out to several different locations and looked across different soil types and they compared those strips that were more conventionally managed. So some of those um, had tillage, all of them had no cover crops and they compared them to uh, what we're calling here soil health in those bars, uh, which was a cover crop and reduced tillage. And then they also measured if they could find a spot nearby with the same soil types. Uh, we call it rangeland here, but it would be essentially a perennial or less disturbed um, area of a field or nearby field. And so what's really cool about this is that they found, um, we found this exact trend, right? That um, the conventional um, disturbed or no cover cropped areas of the fields had lower infiltration, cover crops significantly increase that an average of 59% across these locations and soil types. And that the infiltration rate was the same or even higher on um, the areas that were um, more perennially based or, or less disturbed and less disturbed, right? So it was the same trend that we found across all those studies, which is really cool to demonstrate that on farms, we see the same pattern that cover crops, even after a year or two can lead to an improvement in something that's as important as infiltration. And then finally, just wanna share this uh, quote from one of the farmers who's participating in this project is a news release that NRCS put together, you know, talking about the flooding that we had last year. Of course, it was a very unusual flood event. We had, you know, mostly frozen soils. So that water really had nowhere to go, right? But this farmer is noting that on the areas where he had cover crops, that once that water was able to recede, that he felt that the, the soil didn't just act like a sponge, it act like an, acted like an arc, which I think is such a great um, metaphor here for the, the value of having that continuous cover um, on your field. So yeah, just in closing, you know, what, what have we found, right? We found that these continuous living cover practices, including cover crops, 
have the largest, most consistent increases to infiltration that is, you know, carried through on experimental uh, fields and on farms. And I would just encourage us, I'd love to hear discussion or anything that Mark has to share in his experience just about the way that we can expand our thinking about cover crops just using water. I hear that a lot in Nebraska. Most of the state has a lot less water than you do in Iowa, other parts of the Eastern Corn Belt. But let's think beyond that, that in those dry times, that the benefit that you can get from holding on to more moisture and having better soil structure and organic matter, reducing evaporation, there's a lot of other elements of the water cycle that can be improved with cover crops. And I think that is really critical as we think about this increasing rainfall variability that we are all seeing um, year to year or, or week to week. So uh, look forward to your questions and, and to joining some of the breakout groups and to hearing what else um, Mark has to share. So thank you. Thanks, Andrea. And if you have questions for Andrea, please put those in the chat box. All right, Mark, let's get you up and going. There we go. Rookie operational here. Um, so I'm not gonna have quite as fancy and polished uh, presentation as Andrea, but uh, I'm kind of coming at it as the other side from the farmer, uh, putting it actually all together, putting it in the field and seeing how it operates. A um, little background, we've been in the uh, no-till, strip-till system now on our farms for about 20 years. We take that same information and incorporate it into my management business here. Uh, where we look after a lot of farms for absentee landowners. And so when we were in the flat black soils of north central Iowa, the Des Moines lobe, so we're a little different than a lot of people as far as uh, conservation and cover crops and that type of thing. But there are tremendous benefits that we see from it. So we're starting out today. One of the main things I want to talk about is just soil health. What is soil health? And it's kind of interesting. If you get on the Google, uh, in Google Soil Health, there's over 500 million entries for soil health. And I think that's interesting uh, that there's that many out there. And if you look at the NRCS, their definition of soil health is the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And so I think that's a real interesting way of putting it, that it's just not for the soil, but it's the soil's interaction with us, with livestock, and with the plants that we grow and develop and uh, hopefully make money and market here in, in the United States. So if you could pull, go to the next slide, um, according to the University of, uh, I think it's North Dakota, um, the five soil principles that we uh, put into to use soil health principles. First one being soil armor or cover. And that's what, this is a, a spring uh, picture of soil uh, covered with a perennial rye, or excuse me, uh, yeah, perennial winter rye that we've seeded. This is the best case scenario. This is what we love to see. Don't always happen that way, but this is what we like to see in our part of the world. Uh, the second principle is minimizing soil disturbance plant diversity. That's one of the main things that we're trying to incorporate into this part of the world is getting away from just straight corn and soybeans and a lot of monoculture of continuous corn. Uh, we have a lot of corn markets. We have a extensive livestock feeding, ethanol markets. So we do have a lot of corn in this part of the world. The other thing is the continued live root or plant growing past the normal cash crop time frame. And even in this part of the country, everyone thinks that we're cold, we're farther north, that we can't do things, but we probably waste almost three months of our season that where we could have a living root or a plant growing after the and before the corn and soybean crops. And that's what we like to see. And it's amazing. That picture that you see in front of you was the first week in April and um, how much growth and green there can be even when it's cold and just barely coming above freezing. And then the last part uh, principle that we're looking for to incorporate it with ours is using livestock and integrating livestock back into our landscape and into our cropping practices. 
Um, in this part of the world, livestock in the open fields is contained basically to um, along our river basin, some of our rougher ground. We uh, no longer have our fences and, and livestock out in the fields like we did when my grandfather and when I was a kid. And we're trying to see if we can put that back into it. So on our farm, we raise corn and soybeans. We have uh, seed production for cover crop seed production. And then we also have about 40 acres of hay that we put up. So we have trying to incorporate some uh, small grains back into our rotations to where we can make it profitable and work for everyone else. So if you could go to the next slide, I will have to admit um, all of the good pictures that you'll see in the presentation coming up, those are taken by my daughter who has much better uh, photographic eye than I do. The basic farmer ones that you see here that we've seen so far, these are from me. So this is a picture from my hilliest, roughest farm that I farm. And to most people you look at it and it looks flat as a table. Um, but it is. Um, this point, I'm on the highest point in the farm. We're about 100 feet above the, the green flat soybean stubble that you can see in the background. But again, this is a perfect year. This is a uh, cereal rye that was flown on in the fall. And this is a shot early in the spring before any field work has gotten away, underway. And if you look in the distance, you can see the rest of the landscape in our part of the world, which is heavy tillage and uh, black soils un uncovered throughout the growing or through the non-cropping season. So if you could go to the next slide. One of the main things that we are looking at and trying to incorporate, so we strip till all of our corn and we no-till all of our soybeans into the residue from the prior year. So we are strip tilling here. This is a picture of actually the spring and we had one of the most beautiful springs to where we could actually get our work done in a timely manner and get it done under good conditions. So we, this is early, uh, last few days of March, first week in April, as far as when we're strip tilling. And we're able to utilize that soil and, and get that structure set that we wanna see and get our fertility put down in the ground. Um, I use a soil warrior, which is a coulter machine in our system. It works well, it's a high speed machine and um, it works great for us. So if you go to the next slide. And this is one of the things that, this is a picture that my daughter took and just out of the blue when I started looking through them, didn't even realize that you can see the earthworm and the, and the structure of that soil just as she was taking a picture from, from uh, laying on her stomach. And, um, that's one of the things that we've highly seen a change in our soils as to where we have that crumbly structure of soil now and the uh, earthworms. Uh, almost every time you do anything, if you dig up a scoop shovel full of soil, you'll have 10 to 40 night crawlers or worms or red wigglers in that. And, and it's really changed our soil's ability to absorb and, and store water. And that's one of the things we've been through a cycle now of excessive rainfall, where we've done everything we can to get rid of the excess moisture. But now last summer and coming in through so far this fall and early winter, we're running severely behind normal as far as amounts of moisture. So we're trying to keep every bit of uh, moisture that we can and not waste it to have it stored up for next year's crops. So next slide, please. And this is uh, one of the best case scenarios. This is early spring. This is April 16th, planting corn. Uh, that same field that we stripped a couple weeks earlier now, the, the rye is coming on. It's providing excellent cover for us. Uh, the root system typically this time of the year is two to three times uh, more growth underground than there is on top. So if you have two to three inches of rye on top, we have six to 10 inches of, of roots in the ground, soil roots, and we, we love to see that. Planting conditions this year were beautiful for planting. We had, um, even though when you look at that strip, it looks a little rough. When you hot hit that with the planter and our residue managers, it was just like uh, potting soil. And it was beautiful this year. And uh, this is exactly, again, what we shoot for every year. It doesn't always happen because you have to deal with the weather, but uh, it is where we're at. In the distance, you can see the small town that I farm and live around, uh, the little town of Badger Island. So if you want to move forward, one more slide. And this is a lot of what we look like when we plant soybeans. So 
soybeans, this is from a couple of years ago where we had a lot more early spring growth. We almost plant all of our crops, as you noticed in the last two slides, as gr into green cover crop. We do not terminate our cover crop until after it's planted. And sometimes uh, this year we did some corn where we did only put one application of herbicide on when the cover crop was about a foot tall. And uh, we had excellent luck with that this year. Um, we're trying to encourage and hopefully do more of that next year. This is soybeans being no-tilled into corn stalk residue, standing corn stalk re residue with over a foot of uh, cereal rye growing in it at the time of planting. So this field here has been planted and that's the tracks that you see in the, in the cover crop there. So next slide. So one of the things that we're trying to do as, as Andrea talked about is to is to provide that armor or that cover to the soil for when we don't have perfect conditions. And uh, this is a shot that my daughter took of our buildings and uh, pasture where her horses are at um, right before a big thunderstorm. And, um, you know, we, we have crazy uh, rainfall events now that we seem to never have when we were growing up or in our younger days. And so these are things that we're trying to prepare for and to try to provide that protection for our soil because our soil health is the, uh, the productivity that we need for the future and for our future generations. My son, my daughter, hopefully in the future, this will be part of their operation as we move forward. So next slide, slide please. And this is what we shoot for. And um, this was, uh, the same after that thunderstorm went through on the backside and we had a beautiful double rainbow. And, you know, that, that's, the, that's the goal. That's what we're shooting for. We want a beautiful stand of crops, green, lush, and growing after that event and, and how it handles and what it looks like. So all of the things that we're doing right now, we're trying to move forward. We're trying to take all the information that the universities and Andrea have researched and put together and make them practical and put them in the field. Now, I always tell people it's never a uh, end of the road or end of your learning. It's a constant learning path. We move forward every year, every month, basically, uh, changing new things, looking for new goals, and incorporating past information into a strategic plan for the future. So that's towards the end of my presentation. Um, we hope that there's plenty of people out there that would uh, like to uh, ask questions. That's what Andrea and I are here for. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Andrea. We do have a couple minutes for questions. So I'm just going to um, field a couple to you. Um, hey, Mark, could you clarify how many years you've been um, no tilling and cover cropping on your ground? Yeah, so in our we've been incorporating no till and strip till in our system of corn and soybeans for almost 20 years now. We started with our first cover crop back in 2013 and have now switched to 100% uh, cover crop on all my acres here in the last four years. So uh, in that time frame is when we've also incorporated growing our own seed, uh, cereal rye for seed, for cover crop seed, and then also hopefully moving forward to where we will have uh, seed to sell also in the future. So. Great, thank you. Um, and there's a question here um, about, have you ever um, terminated your cover crops without herbicide? Um, I never have in my, in my operation. Uh, we have two or three other guys here in my office that also deal in the same kind of systems. And we've used rolling and crimping in theirs uh, to do some terminating. The biggest problems we have um, and it's not a big problem, but it is something that's a little different than terminal uh, termination with chemicals, is we have varying growth stages of cover crop. And it's hard to get it all into the right stage where we can get 100% termination. But it is something that we're looking at as a potential for the future and, and put that mat down. Now, with the chemical termination, we have been able to get that nice organic mat that gives us excellent uh, weed control later into the into canopy to where we've been able to get excellent weed control with minimal amounts of usage of chemicals and herbicides. Great, thank you. Um, and one question, Andrea, for you, it looks like you have maybe already answered this in the chat box, but could you just talk to everyone 
um, about grazing, especially on corn stalks and that um, impact on infiltration? Sure. And so yeah, that's a great question. I've gotten this a lot as I presented this work. The We only had a, a small number of studies that we could include in that analysis. And we did see that had a slight negative, but no significant effect on infiltration in this in our analysis. And it makes sense, right? In this idea that if you're removing residue or soil cover, you could have a negative effect, whereas adding the residue and roots had a positive effect. So I think that I would take that with a little bit of a grain of salt because it was a small sample size. There's you know, other research that has been done by colleagues of mine in Nebraska where they've not seen that negative impact of, of grazing either uh, cover crops or, um, or, or just crop residue. So 